Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where one might be located. Uh, I'm incredibly excited to be your host today for what promised to be a very exciting event. The first Southeast Asia Hebrew language colloquium sponsored by the School of Hebrew at Middlebury College, the Cambridge Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, the Jakarta Hebrew Learning Program, and the Israeli Embassy in Singapore, together with the Middle East Institute here at NUS. My name is Amim Lutfi, as I said, and I'm a research fellow at NUS. And, um, a, and, and I wanna just take a few seconds to introduce the event to you. We at the MEI or Middle East Institute have across the last year been very invested in both studying and furthering the furthering Asia's pivot towards the Middle East. Um, uh, or a, and, and vice versa as well, Middle East pivot towards Asia. As part of this uh, program across the last year, we uh, organized several events and established partnerships with, with, uh, with research groups and policy centers and academic institute. This year at our, academic, at our annual conference, we focused on Asia's, on Middle East pivots towards Asia from the lens of a rising multipolar world. In this colloquium, we add an important pillar to this effort. We at MEI strongly believe that the key to any partnership is dialogue and any dialogue would not be possible with a shared language and a shared cultural system. So hence in this, con in this colloquium, we explored the possibility of furthering ties through ties with the ties between Middle East and Southeast Asia through one of the oldest language in the Middle East, namely Hebrew. Language, as we all know, is not just a transmitter of information, but it is also a reservoir and a vehicle for cultural history and social norms. Perhaps this is more so true for Hebrew than any other language, a language that spread with its with the forced dispersal of its own commute with its with its original speaking community and by so when we open the window into the relationship between hebrew language in southeast asia and he and and the middle east we also open a door into a lost history or a lost cosmopolitanism and we remind the speakers about a possibility in which these areas these two regions can come together and have a shared cultural discussion without any further delay, I would now like to invite our, for the opening speech, uh, the Honorable um, Mr. Bilahari Kosikan. Mr. Bilahari Kosikan needs very little introduction for most of our audience today, but I would just say a few things. He is the chairman of the Middle East Institute, an autonomous institute of the National University of Singapore. Mr. Kosikan was the permanent secretary of Singapore's Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 2010 to 2013, having served as the prior permanent secretary since 2001. He was subsequently ambassador at large until May 2018. His earlier appointment in the ministry include deputy secretary of Southeast Asia, permanent representative to the UN in New York and ambassador to the Russian Federation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kosikan, if you could turn on your camera and microphone. Yereftov Havarim, Ani Mehot Sameh, Ledabea Etim. But that just about exhausts my Hebrew, except for a few phrases that have no place in a scholarly gathering. Uh, and if I use them, we'll start my friend Ambassador Sagi of Israel wondering what I have been up to in my visits to Israel. So I shall refrain. But anyway, the Middle East Institute of the National University of Singapore is honored to co host this event with the School of Hebrew at Middlebury College, with Cambridge University, and with the Institute of Theology Rahmat Emanuel in Jakarta. This is the first such event on Hebrew language and culture to be held in Southeast Asia, and we are very proud to be part of it. I hope this event will not be the last and such studies will lead, eventually lead to a better understanding of Israeli culture and perhaps more accurately and generally of Jewish culture in this region. Singapore has, has had long-standing and close 
ties with Israel. Indeed, if not for Israel, the course of our development after independence was unexpectedly thrust upon us in 1965 might have been very, very different. The Singapore Jewish community has been an integral part of our society since modern Singapore was founded in the 19th century. The Jewish community's many contributions to Singapore uh, are too numerous to recount this evening. But for anyone interested, I recommend this book. This book, uh, The Jews of Singapore, which is an excellent book. And I assure you, the Middle East Institute gets no royalties. So my recommendation is sincere, sincerely felt. Now, Israel's position in the Middle East has fundamentally changed for the better since the Abraham Accords. And a similar change is long overdue in Southeast Asia. Singapore's relations with Israel and the position of the Jewish community in Singapore are unfortunately still somewhat exceptional in Southeast Asia. The situation is evolving, but alas, far too slowly and not everywhere in this region. Unfortunately, in our region, outmoded and inaccurate ideas, indeed sometimes poisonous and pernicious ideas about Israel and Jews are far too often propagated by the unscrupulous for political advantage. Now, I don't want to dwell on politics, but I thought you ought to have some idea of the context of this colloquium. Languages are not an area of focus of the Middle East Institute, but the context which I have just very briefly mentioned was one of two reasons why when Ustas Sapri broached the possibility of our institute co-hosting this colloquium to me, I grabbed it with both hands. The other reason was of course, Ustas Sapri himself. He's a unique individual, a Muslim scholar who teaches Hebrew in Jakarta, a man who in his own person and by his own actions is trying to foster better understanding between Muslims in Southeast Asia and Israel and better understanding of Jewish culture. He deserves every encouragement. How could I possibly have said no? There is a very ancient Chinese saying that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. A colleague of mine in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs when I worked there, wisely amended this saying to say that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step in the right direction. This colloquium is of course only a very small step, but it is certainly a step in the right direction. Now you didn't come here this night, tonight to listen to me, so I will shut up very soon. And, but I just wanted to end by wishing your colloquium every success. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Bilahari. Um, if I'd, I'd like to now invite His Excellently, Mr. Sagi Karni, who is the new ambassador to Singapore from Israel uh, to say his welcome remarks. To say a few words, Mr. Sag, Mr. The Mr. Ambassador Sagi Karni joined the Israeli Foreign Service in 1995. Uh, his first overseas posting had him stationed in Beijing. He then served as the deputy chairman of mission in Oslo, following which he was a member of the Israeli delegation to the European Union in Brussels. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Mr. Carney. If you could just say a few words in regards to welcome. Thank you very much for your introduction. Good evening. Um, Salamat malam, erev tov. And uh, first I would like to start by um, um, you know, sharing all my praises to my uh, friend uh, Pak Sapri, which I know very well. And it's uh, indeed a very, very uh, exciting thing to, to meet a Hebrew teacher uh, from Jakarta who is dedicating uh, a lot of his efforts and, and good nature to, to teach our language in, in Indonesia. So it's, it's really a great uh, thing and it's a great initiative. And I'm very happy that the uh, Middle East Institute in NUS uh, is hosting this, uh, this event. Um, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman Ambassador Bilhari. Um, we are very, very pleased with that. And we really, really hope that um, this kind of a colloquium will, uh, will enable more people to know about our language and through our language about our culture and about our uh, 
uh, history. Um, but I will not get too much uh, into the uh, nature of the Hebrew language because you have here scholars uh, from Israel, Vardit and Yaron, and I'm sure they are more uh, apt to, to describe our language. I just say for the sake of the uh, students of uh, Sapri here, is that the Hebrew language is, is, is not an easy one, but it's very structured one. It, it builds like, uh, like a Lego building blocks, binyanim. So um, I, I really recommend, you know, anyone who is uh, interested to, to invest in the, uh, in the foundation of the language and when you get the, the idea, then it, it's much easier later on. Um, Ambassador Bilhari mentioned the changes in the Middle East and indeed there is um, a very fundamental change in the Middle East, positive one, but that's not to say that everything is, is great in the Middle East, that, that not to say that all the problems have been solved, uh, far from that, but there are some very interesting and positive uh, changes in the Middle East and the um, Abrahamic Accord in which Israel um, signed um, a peace agreement and established diplomatic, diplomatic relations with uh, four uh, Arab Muslim countries in the last year, uh, UAE, uh, Bahrain, uh, Sudan, and Morocco. It's, um, it's, it's a very interesting and, and, and very important symptom to this uh, fundamental change. And I hope that uh, here in Southeast Asia, we will see that the good news are reaching and uh, people will appreciate the change and will be open uh, to accept those changes. Um, from my encounter with uh, Indonesians, I um, always have a very, very positive uh, response. I found that there is uh, a, a serious interest to know more about Israel. I always sense that there is an interest in meeting Israelis, doing business with Israelis, and also travel to, to Israel. Um, we have been um, very lucky to have, until the uh, COVID-19 crisis started, to have a very large number of, uh, of uh, Indonesians visiting Israel. In the year uh, 2019, we have close to 40,000 visitors, Muslims, Christians, uh, coming for business and coming for tourism. So I really, really hope that um, when we we'll, um, get over this uh, crisis, uh, we'll be able to host you uh, back in, in our country, uh, in Israel. Um, and, and, and with that, I can also recommend uh, the students of Sabri uh, when things will get better, uh, to come to Israel, to study Hebrew also in Israel. And in Ulpan, we have a very good system of teaching Hebrew. In Ulpan, you can study and uh, make your Hebrew uh, even better and more fluent, uh, studying in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem. So you are very, very uh, welcome to come and study in Israel. And um, with that, I would just like to, to end my, uh, my remarks and wishing our uh, Muslim uh, friends, Ramadan uh, Karim, Ramadan Mubarak, and um, it's a pleasure and I'll uh, stay on to, 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 to follow the colloquium. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those very insightful remarks. I think we have a photo session with, I'm not sure how that works on Zoom, but. Uh, Sharon, if you could guide us to how the photo taking would work. No, sorry. I mean, we're not doing that. So you just, okay. Quote, but it, yeah. Okay, okay. Since since we're now in uh, in the Zoom age, we will skip that part and go on to the the real meat of the conference, really, uh, with our first session on title, language, and culture: the what and the how. This this session will be led by Dr. Wardit Ringwald. If I could just say, take a few seconds to introduce her. Dr. Wardit Ringwald serves as a CV Star Professor in language and linguistics at the director of Middlebury School of Hebrew. She was appointed as the founding director of the Middlebury School of Hebrew in 2008, while serving as professor of Hebrew and director of, director of, the, of the Arabic language programs at Brandeis University. 
Dr. Ringwald will be responsible for oversight and implementation of Hebrew Across America 2020, from recruitment of new faculty members to the curricular and co-curricular design and budget administration. So in short, it's somebody who's extremely relevant and extremely well suited to kick off our discussions today. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Wardet. If you could just uh, unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Thank you so much, Toda Shalom, for this introduction. And I'm going to share my screen so you can see my presentation. Um, and I want to welcome you all to this colloquium. Uh, we worked really hard to make it happen. And I want to thank all the organizer for making it happen. Uh, I chose to speak today about the connection between uh, language and culture. And uh, Ambassador Carney mentioned the fact that this is uh, the Hebrew language is a complicated and difficult language. What makes it even more complicated is the fact that uh, we need not only to talk about the language, but the language in its connection to the culture. So the goal of my presentation today is to share key practices and challenges and some thoughts on the what and the how of making culture an integral part of the Hebrew language and culture. Um, just hold on a second. Uh, um, okay, Elizabeth is giving me some instruction. Um, Elizabeth, what is, is that, am I okay, Elizabeth, in terms of the? Yes, uh, perfect, thank you. I just wanted to go full screen, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Okay, I would like to start by, actually, I would like to start the, to state that as a matter of fact, uh, scholars, practitioners, and even learners uh, share the understanding that culture and language are intertwined to the extent that most of them even view language as culture. And it's reflected in cast hall uh, comments or remarks in 2012, and I quote, uh, in the best language education happening today, the study of another language is synonymous with the study of another language, of uh, another language, of another culture. I'm sorry, of another culture. Now, in the second language acquisition field, we use uh, the following uh, concept in order to describe culture, and it's actually the way culture is described in many other disciplines. And there are two uh, core concepts uh, that uh, this, uh, uh, the essence of culture uh, relies on. And the first concept is the differentiation between what we call uh, the macro C or the big C, uh, which is uh, uh, reflect the canonic culture of, of the language and versus the small C or the micro C, which refers to the nature of the native speaker daily life, noting that there is uh, this, the two C's have equal values. The fact that one is canonic doesn't make it better or more important than the, the, the culture of the daily life. The other concept <clears throat> is uh, that the, the other concept related to this essence of culture is that the big C and the small C are represented in two forms cultural product produced by the native speakers, which are the cultural artifacts, and as well as cultural practices, which are the rituals or behavior shared by the native speaker of the target language. Now, both the products and the practices represent the perspective of the target language culture, which includes the values, assumptions, beliefs, feelings, that are associated with the target language and the target culture. Now, um, the issue of in the, the question or the inquiry on how to integrate culture studies into the language program actually started back in the 60s, because in the 60s, uh, it was very popular as part of the curriculum in higher education to, stand, to send students abroad to, uh, to spend time a year or a semester in another country using another language, meeting people from other cultures. Uh, but these questions about the, 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 how to integrate the culture studies into the language program were intense, uh, in, intensified in the 90s when the study of the 
uh, the cultural studies actually became part of the academic disciplines. And these are the challenges that these, uh, um, the educators, the language educators confronted when they start to this inquiry. The first one was how to teach culture to students with limited or um, a limited or, or very low level of proficiency. They don't know the language, how can we teach the culture? The second one is how to avoid the creation of stereotypes, which is a huge, huge uh, issue within the language, uh, in language teaching, especially in the lower level when we try to limit it uh, to, to do a lot of generalization. So in, in the way we create stereotypes and there are many, many uh, examples that we can see even textbook that uh, supporting this creation of these stereotypes. And the other one is, which is also very important, is how to teach a culture which contradicts or conflicts with the learners' uh, values from their own cultures. And the last one is how to present perspective, which is unlike the practice and the product, it's, it's very intangible. It's more difficult and more complex to teach. So I would like to start by, um, by uh, answering this, uh, by, letting you know, by, by letting you know exactly how uh, scholars and practitioners in the fields approach these issues. And basically there are two categories in which uh, they, they behave. One is uh, actually more um, passive or I would call implicit way to teach culture. If culture is language and language is culture, there are some practitioners who say we don't need to teach the culture. By, by the nature of teaching the, the language, we teach the culture. Other say when we use authentic materials to teach a language, authentic materials is materials that was created by native speaker for native speakers. So it's embedded, culture is embedded in the material. So therefore we don't need to teach culture um, explicitly. However, there are those who teach the culture more explicitly by choosing aspect of the culture that is pleasant and agreeable in order not to let the students feel that they are uh, studying something that contradicts their values. Or uh, the last one, uh, use the first, use first language to teach the culture, either by offering cultural courses or inserting or infusing uh, information in form of anecdotes uh, to, uh, in, in the textbook, just to shed light on different cultural uh, point. Um, so these are basically the common uh, practices. Another common practice is really to follow a standard that was created by an organization that called ACFIL, American Council of the Teaching of Foreign Languages, that created a set of standards for teaching languages in the United States and maybe even beyond the United States. And one of the standards is actually focusing on the study of culture. And this standard is helping practitioners and leaders of programs to, uh, to guide them on how to create goals and expectations vis-a-vis their learners when they talk about culture. And the focus here is about understanding. So the expectation is that students will demonstrate an understanding of the relationship between practice and perspectives and also the understanding between product and perspectives. Now, in the School of Hebrew at Middlebury College, we actually follow these standards. These standards guide us in how we teach the culture. This is a picture of our first cohort in the school in from 2008. In the school we teach, we have three different programs. We have an intensive immersive language program. We also have a master's degree in teaching Hebrew as a second language. And recently, a few years ago, we started with a doctoral degree in, in the research of pedagogy of the Hebrew language. And the question is really how to teach the Israeli culture in our school. It's a big question. And I want to share with you some of our practices. So in, we do follow these standards. And in order to achieve the, stan the standards, we are using a recommendation that were created in 2007 by the Modern Language Association, in, which in their report, they suggested the following. They suggested that these elements or ingredients will be part of our curriculum when we teach the language. So we are not only teaching the language, but we're also making sure that students will engage 
in the target language, will be actively engaged in the target language. We will support them to identify elements of the culture within uh, the language and uh, how the language is behaving according to different cultural contexts to help them develop curiosity so they can become a lifelong learners in a sense that they will always will be curious and learn about the culture. And also tools to analyze and critique the culture because this is a place when they, they can combine their own perspective about the culture and bring their perspective to the, to the target language culture. And of course, one of the most important things is to help them develop empathy so they can accept and be receptive to the other uh, culture that they are studying uh, through, the, through the language. Now, in order for this to, in, in, another uh, element that uh, really help us uh, realize or execute this uh, cultural studies within the language program is the fact it's the nature of our school. So as I mentioned before, when they teach a language, we teach it in an intensive immersive environment. And uh, the school that actually was created in 105 years ago has uh, created a methodology, uh, which the motto of this methodology is that life does not come with subtitles. So therefore, uh, every student or teacher or even staff member who come to the school need to pledge that they're going to use only the target language, in our case, the Hebrew, in order to uh, be able to support us, uh, to support the students in engaging with language um, all the time, almost 24 seven. And this is the language that the, of, of the blurb of the pledge that they are signed when they get uh, into the program. I'm just going to read the first one. In signing this language pledge, I agree to use Hebrew as my only language of communication and so forth while, so forth while I am in the program. So by the nature of this pledge, support us in supporting our students, students to be engaged in the language all the time but on, only that. One of the principles that guide us in our curriculum, it's also taken from uh, the methodology that uh, Actwell created back in the 90s, uh, which really a, a support or create uh, the, the goal for our students, not only to know about the language, but also to be able to use the language, to function in the language in all four skills, in a real life setting in all language skills. This is a scale, which I'm not going to go into the scale, but this is a scale that really specify, there, is, there are definition for all the scale, that they specify the different levels of students' abilities to function in the language vis-a-vis -vis a native speaker. And the goal of this approach is really to support students to become uh, users of the language in authentic language in cultural context. So this is another principle that guide us when we teach the language and the culture together. Now, the other thing that we do, of course, is they engage uh, both formally and informally with diverse group of scholars and practitioners. We bring to the program uh, a scholars from a diverse group of scholars from different disciplines, including such literature. Yaron is here, is one of our professors at the, at the, the program, uh, sociology, history, anthropology. But we also bring people who produce culture, such as artists uh, from visual arts, performers, authors, poets, and actors. So, so the students can engage with people who can help them analyze the culture and also people who can talk about the creation of uh, the culture. Now, in our curriculum, uh, when we formulate the curriculum, we also develop an opportunity to develop curiosity, to research, and also give the students tool to analyze and critique the language uh, in a very systematic way. One of the key uh, principles to avoid creating stereotypes is by approaching the teaching of the language and the culture in a very systematic way. And here is an example of how we use, uh, a, the, use the teaching of culture within the language curriculum in, uh, in, in, in lower level, when we create or we infuse anecdotes about um, the culture 
and the anecdotes are, are related to the theme of the chapter or the topic that they are studying. So you have two examples. One is effect, effects and information about Shai Agnon, uh, the, the, the author Shai Agnon. And the other one, which is very interesting, is actually in a, 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 a debate about uh, the heroic, uh, um, heroic event in the Jewish history of Masada. And this is actually a postmodernist view on, uh, on this uh, event that asks questions about it and not just describe it. So it's more of a form of critiquing or, or giving an opinion about this event. So in the upper level courses, we also, of course, teach courses, content-based courses, and, uh, we, and these are the topics that we present. Uh, we do it in the native, we do it in Hebrew, in the second language. Uh, we know that some, in some places, they do it in the first language. Uh, and uh, we use our scholars, of course, to with different expertise to do that. What we do in all of the level, we use authentic materials. So this is an implicit way to bring the culture. And by and we also activate what we call the project-based learning when students need to do a lot of research using the target language, using Hebrew in order to learn more about uh, the culture. Also outside the classroom, because this is an immersive intensive program, they have an opportunity to use the language in cultural context during their daily routine. As, and also uh, we ask them, the part of their commitment is to participate in co-curricular activities in which they activate their senses in artistic or physical, uh, cult in, or physical or social cultural activities uh, in order to be able to feel the culture and be integrated in the culture, be part of the culture, even to create their own cultural um, uh, artifacts. So looking at the culture as insiders and not just at students who are looking at it as outsiders. One of the key concepts that we activate all the time is reflection. We ask students to constantly reflect on their experience in the target language in Hebrew, in order for them to raise their awareness on, a, uh, on issues related to the culture. And we do it through the, either through discussion or through the fact that they can also create cultural, cultural artifact or product as an opportunity to, um, it's, it's, an, it's a way, it's a venue to reflect on the, uh, on the culture. So this is the kind of uh, a, 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 an illustration in, 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 what, in, in the way that our students um, experience or learn about the culture. Uh, this is, uh, the on, they don't, they're not only learning, they're also experiencing the culture. They are constantly using authentic language. They engage with scholars, practitioners, and they reflect all the time. So just to summarize, uh, the whole uh, uh, the teaching of language, the teaching of, of culture within uh, the language curriculum is a multi-level approach to a multi-level enterprise in which students who are acquiring Hebrew using functional, authentic language in authentic setting with a diverse group of native speakers who represent different academic disciplines or sectors in the Israeli society while learning, experiencing, and reflecting on both at the macro and the micro level of the Israeli culture. So Daraba, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that insightful talk and really starting us off with an understanding of the close ties between language and culture and how as part of a language program we might strive to bring those two elements together. Now I would like to invite all our attendees to join the discussion sessions. You can send in, type in your questions and send it to us and I will read them out for you. Alternatively, you can also raise your hand and you'll be called upon to unmute yourself and open your micro, open your camera and directly ask the question. 
So I, if I, I can ask, start with a question that I have received from one of our colleagues here, Jan. And she says, thank you for such a great presentation, Dr. Wardet. Culture is very vital as it, as it defines and as the whole of what people have done and made. Can you elaborate more on what aspects of cultures the best to learn to master Hebrew uh, language? Thank you very much. Uh, this is a question from Benny Utayana, sorry. So if you're looking at the aspects of culture, it, it, it's an interesting question because when you need to make a choice of what to teach, not necessarily only on how to teach, but of what to teach, there are two approaches. So one is be very systematic about it. Uh, and um, one of the courses that we actually a, a offer in our master's program is a, a clear historical approach to the teaching of the Israeli culture. And a, in, in order for, for students and, and, and future teachers to be able to get insight into the development of the Israeli culture. Uh, the other approach is really is anecdotal approach. Uh, what guides the the content of the culture is really the language. So if you decide to teach, um, or it's part of your curriculum is to teach an, a linguistic element, you need to find out if this element is being associated with, a, with, cultural, a, 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 with any cultural elements. For example, if we teach students how to ask for directions and we teach them about the map of a city and the city has names of different uh, personalities from the, um, from the re representing the Israeli culture, we then infuse information and anecdotes about these people and so on. So it's really, because it's such a complex, um, it's very complex because culture is not one thing and uh, you need to be able to make choices knowing that at the end of the semester or the year or, um, or the end of the program, they will be able to demonstrate the understanding of the culture and its connection mostly to perspective, what this culture represents. One of the key elements to think about it is how to avoid stereotypes. This is very easy to do when you teach culture, uh, basically because you try to do general, general, to generalize a, a phenomena in order to make it easier for the students to understand. And actually by doing that, you can create stereotypes. And this is a um, very dangerous, in my opinion, approach to the teaching of the culture. I hope I answered your question. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have a related question. Um, and if I could ask you to, this, it comes in from a colleague of mine here at the Middle East Institute, Alex Arduino. Alex asked, uh, uh, what kind of cultural bias in particular do you find more difficult to overcome while teaching Hebrew? So because we're using authentic materials and we use authentic materials mostly because uh, in, 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 for, through the lens of language acquisition, this is the best way for students to acquire the language. It's meet the language in its true cultural and uh, in the context of the, of the, the native speaker use of the language. Um, sometimes there are elements of the culture that are biased or contradict with the, um, with the student's view of the world. And I can give you an example, which I'm always using this example. So if there are students of mine here who heard about this example, I apologize. Um, in my conversation class, I brought authentic part of the bringing authentic materials was a discussion, a, a recorded discussion from the Israeli TV, uh, a debate. And the way that people share their opinion in Israel didn't, <laughs> did not actually was very agreeable to a few of our, my students. Uh, they didn't like the fact that people are not from their perspectives. They are not respect each other's um, um, opinions, they cut their, 
uh, the cut them and uh, they, they left the course. They say that if this is the culture of the language that I'm teaching, um, we are not, uh, we would not want to be part of this, uh, of this course or to, to learn the language. Now, this is a very extreme example. And this extreme example is um, it's just to show you, to illustrate to you that people come from their from their perspective and, and the shift from their perspective to the perspective of the native speakers, it's, 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 it's complicated and it's, it's a long process, which we need to take into consideration. What I needed to do at this point is to concentrate more on the perspectives of the culture of, of the Israeli or the Israeliness and before even presenting these materials to, to, um, to my students. But this is one of the examples and there are many, uh, there are many others. Can I just quickly ask how you responded to these students in this situation? Hey, this, for, this for me was actually the point that I've started to, to gain interest about what's really going on. I, as an Israeli, I couldn't, I found that I myself, I could not relate to the perspective of the learner. So this is the place where I started to, the, my journey in understanding the connection between language and culture. And I respected their perspectives and I cannot change the culture. I had some, a few conversations uh, with them and they actually I used this opportunity to learn more about the issue. Thank you uh, so much. I have a question here from uh, Dr. Jaron Peleg. Uh, Dr. Peleg asked, from your long experience, are there specific challenges you see in teaching Hebrew in various parts of Asia? Uh, I think that uh, um, from my experience, and I see it, uh, I mean, the only experience that we had even as a group is visiting, and I know that they fought it here, visiting um, our visit, our conference that we did in China. One of the things that I need, I think we need to understand is the fact that language, yes, it's about, of course, the foundation has to do with words and grammar and vocabulary and so forth. But if we are not going to contextualize it, in a true, authentic cultural context, we will never be able to understand the perspectives, the in-depth perspectives of the native speaker and the culture of this, the culture of the native speaker. So I think that there needs to be a shift in the way we look at the, uh, the study of language, um, moving from understanding learning about the language and using what we know about the language in order to be able to function in the language in cultural context. Thank you so much. If I could just uh, ask you a question from myself. Um, I'm wondering if you, about the demographics or the kind of students who, who take the initiative to enroll in such a program and have you seen a change uh, in this over the, let's say, over, over, the, over your, the span of your career as well? Um, well, there are three profiles, I would say, if I may use this word, three profiles of students who come to this immersive, intensive immersive program. Um, one is the, those who need it for their scholarly work, uh, students who need to expedite their ability to understand to have an in-depth understanding of the language. Uh, so these are usually doctorate students or stu students from all, uh, from different, uh, at different levels. Uh, the other group is those who are, um, I would say they need it for their, as an instrumental tools for their work. Um, mostly people from the NGO world who, who would like to go to Israel and, and contribute to the society by joining different organization. And those who are heritage learners, those that Hebrew is part of their heritage. These are the three groups. Have I seen changes? No, 
Uh, basically, this is a very steady profile, and I've been doing this at Middlebury for 15 years almost. And uh, the one exciting thing about the program that people are coming from all over the world. We have students from the Arab world, students from Asia, students from Europe, um, all with one goal to, to conquer Hebrew <laughs> in, for their own purposes. Yeah, for their own goals, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I could ask one more question from my side, it's about, um, that one of the problems with some at times with summer programs is that you become fluent over the period and then as time goes on you lose your ability is there any uh, any way that that a system could be built in for refresher or is there any ways to what what, what advice do you give to students to make sure that they keep up with the language and they don't lose the skills that they acquire so i have two answers for you one is when we use the approach in which we encourage students not only to learn about the language, but also to acquire the language, to internalize the language. And I mentioned the proficiency approach that we use. I mentioned the authentic language that we use. There is no much of attrition or the, the retention is there. And we experience students who are coming every summer, how they actually move on from one level to another. So it's really about the way you approach the teaching and the learning of the language. But however, in addition, we do offer, a, during the academic year, we do offer meetings in Hebrew in order to maintain the language. The, one, the other thing is that we equip our students by the end of the program with different tools that they can activate when they are out in the, in the real world in order to keep up with the language. Okay, thank you so much. Um, if there are no further questions, um, you can still send them in. Okay, we have a question here. Um, it is from, uh, from MPA, Jun Zhang He. Uh, and the question is uh, about Hebrew language education in China. And it says that the only carried out in very few public universities by teaching staff who mostly majored in Arabic language. Then how do you foster the Israeliness under such conditions? So Israeliness you can foster in different ways. Uh, again, I'm going back to the, the one of the prince for the guiding principles, which is you can do it in an implicit method by using authentic materials. When you meet the real language and cultural context, you actually gain understanding in, er in any element related to Israeliness. This is one, if, if, uh, one of the ways to do it. So, so actually connecting the curriculum or yourself with authentic materials, it's the one uh, way to do it. Um, I've learned something from students from, we have a group of students from Saudi Arabia to come and do and study with us and do also the advanced degrees with us. The way that they are actually gain an in-depth understanding um, about the language is through translation. Translation is a way to that requires you as a translator to better understand the culture behind the words and the sentence and the topic that is presented. And translation is a wonderful tool to uh, dive into uh, or immerse into culture. In our case, it is Israel or Israeliness. Yeah. OK, thank you so much. I have uh, my colleague, Dr. Asif Shuja, who has his hands up. So if I could ask uh, Asif to unmute himself and turn on his camera. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amin. Uh, uh, because, uh, you know, what has been mentioned about uh, Dr. Sapri here, uh, you know, uh, Muslim uh, teaching Hebrew in Jakarta, uh, in Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim populated country. And I happen to know a friend of mine who has been teaching uh, Hebrew in India, the Apex University, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Dr. Khushid Imam. He's a devout Muslim, a close friend. And he is, if you ask someone who has been teaching Hebrew in India, uh, the third largest Muslim population country, 
uh, that is devout Muslims. So uh, I don't know about Pakistan, but these are three countries, top three countries where uh, these Muslims have been uh, teaching crypto. So a uh, natural question uh, attached to this is that there has to be a lot of similarities between the culture of uh, Jews and, and Muslims, uh, if not Islam. Uh, so I would like to ask my uh, you know, honored uh, uh, speaker here, uh, what are those most prominent you know, similarities between these two, uh, Muslim culture and uh, the Jews culture? Uh, which is linked to uh, learning language, uh, which actually, uh, you know, attract these Muslims uh, to teach Hebrew. Thank you so much. So I'm not sure I'm the expert in both cultures uh, or religions that I can answer um, uh, your questions. I just, from observing students who are coming from these two different worlds, I think that the values are similar. Uh, uh, and and therefore it's it's very easy to connect uh, one culture with another. This is my experience. Um, besides the fact that they're both Semitic languages and it's uh, easy to make the connection in terms of the language, uh, the values in terms of uh, um, um, the, 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 the basic values are the same. So um, I see my students from the two worlds uh, respect each other's uh, religions, religion practices. I, I've noticed that even uh, the, the, the values are so similar or they, they, get it, they, they, they share understanding is so the same that I can share with you that our Muslim students participate sometimes in the, in the religious ceremonies of Jews and vice versa because they feel that they can gain better understanding through the lens of their own understanding of, of the religion uh, and, and connect with this. And, and the respect, the respect that they, the, the value, which is the respect to others' uh, religion. But again, I'm not expert in this, so I will leave this question maybe to other people to answer. This is only from my observation um in the way students from both worlds uh, interact in our program thank you i have another question and uh, this is from ong baojuan and asking that uh, is learning hebrew more visual or oral oral as in with an a in the initial learning stage so one of the key concepts that we know as language educators that uh, there are different styles of learning a language. And there are different, strat different strategies. And we actually dedicate a one, actually a course in our master's degree program on how to understand the learners. So it's really up to the learner to make a decision on how is best for him or her to study the language. And there are ways to evaluate this. We, there are tools to evaluate to help each learner understand their style and their strategies, how to learn a language. And it, can, it doesn't have to be one. You can have one, more than one styles. I'm, for example, I'm an auditory, but also a visual learner. And, and each student should know about their own uh, styles and make sure that the teachers or the, the language educators know about it as well so they can match uh, the, the curriculum to the, to the learner's need. Okay, I think that is about the time we have for the session. Uh, I want to thank uh, you, Dr. Wardet Ringwald, for this very exciting or sort of really setting the tone for uh, the for the conference at large. So thank you so much for that exciting speech. Uh, now, if we could move in to our second session of the day and build on this the this very theme about the overlaps and relationship between culture and language. I'm very excited to introduce Professor Yaron Pelik. Uh, Dr. Pelik is a Kennedy Lay reader in modern Hebrew studies at the University of Cambridge. Professor Pelik published widely on a number of topics in modern Hebrew literature, Israeli cinema, Israeli culture, more broadly, including several books and numerous articles on Israeli militarism, homoeroticism gender, masculinity, ethnicity, class, and religiosity. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Pelle. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. 
All right, let me share my screen with you. And um, can you see it? Yes, 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 we can see it. Okay. All right, thank you very much. So uh, what I would like to do is to uh, speak about the connections between the Hebrew language and Hebrew culture more broadly. And within culture, I'd like to to, to um, focus on uh, literature, which is Hebrew literature, which is a subject I teach at university and have been for some years. One of the um, interesting things about Hebrew, one of the unique things about Hebrew is the long textual history it has. And the fact that it goes back many, many years uh, in the past and that there is a very old corpus of the language. Uh, this is one interesting thing about Hebrew. The other interesting thing is that uh, because of the history of the Jewish people, the Hebrew language was very important in, um, in, in, in Jewish history. And for um, most of Jewish history, the language in fact contained the culture and the religion. And because Jews traveled and was dis were dispersed all over the world, the language was uh, a uh, repository of a lot of their culture. And it holds a very, important and outsized space within Hebrew culture. So for, and, 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 and when we are uh, um, speaking about modern Hebrew, that kind of history had a very big effect on the development of the culture of modern Hebrew culture, which in many ways was very tightly connected, very significantly connected to the Hebrew language as a cultural component. And um, here I want to um, uh, take you through a very short presentation where I would um, try to, try to um, explain what I mean. So we have in this uh, first slide uh, a visual kind of graph, a visual kind of image of the evolution of what we call the Jewish bookcase, which means the corpus of Hebrew writings that constituted the texts which Jews returned to over and over again and uh, which constituted their cultural heritage. So you have here the, on the bottom left, I mean, I'm sorry, on the uh, top left, you have um, a, a picture of a scroll, which is um, one of the original portable ways in which Hebrew language and culture was recorded. And you have a scroll, a picture of a scroll, uh, which for many centuries was the repository of Hebrew texts. And in the next, in the next line, we have an open book from the Talmud, uh, a book of uh, Hebrew laws and um, uh, 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 um, sort of sage literature about the laws. And on the right-hand side, you have a um, bookshelf with these kinds of religious books closed. And as you can see, they're very uniform and uh, they are um, sort of, um, they, they, they blend into one another, they're very straight. Uh, and what I what wanted to show in this picture is not necessarily about the uniformity of religious Jewish culture before the modern age, but the um, kind of preoccupation with legal uh, texts uh, that were um, expounded in Hebrew, that were discussed in Hebrew, uh, which you see in the open book to the left. And as we go into the modern period, uh, the, the, the line on the bottom, you see a, an open book, just, just uh, a, um, an open book from a random novel. And on the right-hand side, you have a um, bookshelf with uh, modern books and you see the different sizes. You see the, um, uh, you see the, um, uh, you know, the kind of uniformity that you see in the past is not really visible here. And so um, what I'd like to show you in this very short presentation is the kinds of differences that happen to the culture and 
the very importance and centrality of the text of the Hebrew language in this process. Um, and the way we um, sort of conceive about it is, is if you look here, uh, we look at the beginning of the uh, of modern Hebrew culture, which began in Europe in the 19th century. And you see here a line of portraits uh, that represent the uh, first sort of generation of uh, writers. Most of them are men, as you can see, with only one single woman, which I call the fathers and mother of modern Hebrew culture. Uh, in and we'll see more about this as the as a, I I'll explain more about this in the presentation because what I'm trying to to to, to talk about is the uh, connection between uh, culture and language, particularly literature and language, and the peculiarity of the Hebrew of of, of Jewish history is that the uh, first modernizing attempts, or the first attempts to modernize Hebrew culture in the 19th century, involved modernizing the Hebrew language. So the first step religious Jews took out of their religious communities into the greater world was made through the Hebrew language. And here you have in this uh, line of portraits, the first generation of these modern writers who started writing a modern kind of Hebrew for Jews that helped them modernize, helped them think about the world in a uh, different way from the previous tradition and religious way they thought about the language. And as you leave the uh, 19th century and go into the 20th century and into the beginning of Zionist culture, modern Hebrew culture in Palestine, you start seeing a much more diverse field of writers on the uh, top line, you, again, you see a portrait of men, most of him, most of whom wrote prose. And on the, I'm talking about the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and so forth. And on the bottom uh, line, you see portraits of women, most of him, most of whom were poets. And it's a very interesting um, division between men and women here that has to do with the peculiarities of Hebrew culture in which only men in the past, in the traditional period, had access to religious education and therefore access to the language, whereas women did not have that uh, advantage. And so it was very difficult for women to become writers of prose, of Hebrew prose. Um, but since poetry is usually shorter in duration and more limited in terms of vocabulary, um, there were a lot of women who uh, wrote poetry at the time. There was this very interesting division, gender division in Hebrew literature. I'm making a, an exaggeration to make a point. Of course, things are much more complicated, but just to make the point between modernity, uh, religiosity, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew language and religion. And as we go into the state of Israel, now this division, this gender division, of course, is completely, um, not so split, it's much more uh, organic. And you see a mixture of men and women who are uh, participating, participating in creating this language and in um, uh, expanding it and uh, making it more complex and more uh, nuanced, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so now we have sort of like a very general history of the connections between um, language and culture and how important the, um, uh, the Hebrew language was in modernizing um, Hebrew culture as you speak it. And, and because of that, the, um, uh, since Jews historically were very dependent on texts for um, transferring their culture and for learning their culture and for studying their culture, text remain very important also in the modern period. And this is something that when you go into the more advanced level of studying Hebrew, the role of literature becomes very important in understanding the culture. And I'll just give you an example uh, based on some of the people I showed you or talked about before. Here, for example, we see on the top, we see a picture of uh, a writer. We consider him the first modern Hebrew novelist, 
who in 1853 published a novel called The Love of Zion. And if you look at the language of this novel, you will see what I mean by the connections of past and uh, uh, present or future. You see, this is how the, the, the novel opens. And I'm going to read these four lines. There was a man in Jerusalem, just a second. There was a man in Jerusalem in the days of Ahaz, king of Judea, whose name was Joram, the son of Abiezer, a chief in Judea and a general, who had fields and vineyards in the Carmel and the Valley of Sharon, and well, as well as flocks of cattle in Bethlehem of Judea. As you can see this, anyone who knows the Hebrew Bible understands that this Hebrew is a very biblical Hebrew. It is not at all a modern kind of Hebrew. It looks like, it reads like a very uh, a biblical Hebrew. And in fact, what um, Abraham Mapu did is he tried to write a modern novel in biblical Hebrew. But the interesting thing is that although every single word in this novel is taken from the Hebrew Bible, a 2,500-year-old text, none of them appears in the Bible in this context. He completely mixed, mixed the uh, biblical registers and biblical vocabulary in a completely modern way that tried to convey Jewish modernity, but with a connection to the ancient Jewish past. And if you go forward about 70 or so years to 1910 and to read to reading this short story called Nerves but by the fellow on the right, uh, uh, Mr. Brenner, you see here, I chose a um, section from the novel that tries to already invent a kind of conversational Hebrew that uh, is much more lively and much more closer to the life of the readers as opposed to the text in the top of the slide. So here you have, for example, um, I'm reading from the text, mama, mama, shouted the 11 year old with, her, with all her strength. Don't worry, here's, um, here no one gets sent back. The heavy said Jew grabbed our things, it settled then, you'll be staying at my hotel. And in my ear, he whispered a slight mis misunderstanding. It's not completely free, you'll need a visa. I'll explain it later. Again, it's really, the context doesn't really matter right now. What I wanted to show you in this slide is the differences in the use of the Hebrew language for modernizing Jewish existence and Jewish culture, where in the beginning you rely very heavily on biblical language. And as the uh, decades progress and the language becomes more lively and more um, dynamic, there is a uh, literature um, is, is the medium in which a lot of these developments are happening. Um, because this text that you see here at the bottom, the dialogue you see at the bottom, is something that is really invented because at the time in 1910, um, not a lot of people spoke Hebrew so fluently and the writer, Brenner, in many respects invented Hebrew vernacular. And this is the kind of thing that Hebrew literature could do because of the vast uh, corpus it had at its disposal. And that for the first period of modernization, mostly men had access to it. Um, let me see, um, just a second. Uh, and here I'm showing you a text. Uh, this is already a text from 1949, um, the first year of statehood. And um, the reason I'm showing this text is to show you how literature continues to be very, very uh, instrumental, very important in understanding uh, the language. And by involving these literary texts in classes in Hebrew, what you are able to do is to give students of Hebrew access to the nature and culture of, uh, of, the, of, of the culture of the language in, in, in many respects, because what you see in this text is a short story that uh, takes place in 19, that takes place in 1948, what Israelis call the war of independence with the Arabs. A and the story is called the prisoner because a group of Jewish Israeli soldiers is capturing an Arab and he 
he's an innocent, he's not really a soldier, they're capturing him, um, not by mistake, by, um, by, by, by not, not, not rightfully. And one of the soldiers wants to release the captive, the prisoner, and set him free. And he has this, in this passage that we see here, he has an inner debate whether to release the prisoner or not. The reason I wanted to read this text together with participates in the evolution of right now in 1949, it's already Israeli culture. And um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I think yes. you can, right? Yeah, we can, we can. Um, right. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the way this particular writer, S. Yis people that we um, vanquish and we conquer in battle. And, and, and literature, Israeli literature, modern Hebrew literature, participates very... Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better, much better, actually. Oh, okay. Sorry about this. The... Um... Microphone is my the internet is unstable, so I am. Um, yeah, okay, so, um, so the, 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 the culture uh, participate in this moral debate that you see here. Um, okay, just a second. I think it's going to work now, right? Okay, no, okay. Um, so, um, and I'm I'm going to take you through a uh, sort of a few more texts that do this um, along the years. We have here a, a short poem from um, the 1960s, in, in which that expresses uh, the kind of wish by Israelis to uh, disconnect from these grand national. Uh, subjects such as, for example, we saw in the previous literature and here, uh, the speaker is um, talking to his lover uh, and uh, their wish to be just by themselves and just sort of like with the natural world, disconnecting from the political world. But again, literature is participating in this process of development. And we go to the next one, in which uh, this poet, this woman is writing about sort of feminist, um, feminist um, ideas and uh, expressing sort of the feminist revolution in uh, modern Israeli culture, in which she talks about the way that society is making women do things they're not interested in doing or trying to sort of uh, mold them in ways that they feel is um, oppressive. Uh, and again, poetry participates in this cultural discussion. Um, and uh, then this text from uh, the 1990s, in which uh, groups of Israelis who, for example, in the past didn't have so much of a voice in um, as part of the culture, Jews who came not from Europe, but from other countries, primarily from Muslim countries, um, are um, uh, this particular writer, Ronit Matalon, is writing about her own family uh, and who came from Egypt, and she is making them very visible in the culture. For example, this very interesting novel from 1992 is, uh, or five, I can't remember exactly the year, um, has sort of a picture album of her family that uh, she starts every chapter with and then she speaks about them. But again, it's a book that tries to use, it doesn't try, it does that. It uses language, it uses culture to, uh, oh, it uses, it uses language to participate in the cultural debate about the metamorphosis, the, um, the different uh, stages that the culture is undergoing and in which the Hebrew language in Israeli culture, in modern Hebrew culture, 
has a very important role because of the way that, um, because of its history and because of the role it had in modernizing Jews, in taking them from, uh, from uh, the old, more religious, traditional ways and moving, moving them into modernity through the bridge that language afforded them and that was very instrumental in uh, modernizing Hebrew language. And so for um, Hebrew, um, so he, uh, just a second. So for, um, so for uh, Hebrew uh, teachers, especially in the advanced stages, the, um, the role of Hebrew and Hebrew literature is very, very important, important into um, letting students have a glimpse into the inner workings of the culture and the way the culture thinks about itself uh, in some of what my colleague, uh, Dr. Ringbald, has uh, spoken about. And this is more or less what I wanted to say, just to give you a very, very, um, uh, very, very a brief overview about the role of Hebrew uh, literature in the understanding of uh, the culture and the language, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, uh, for the talk and expanding really on the role that literature in particular has played in both the modernization and the relationship between language, religion, and culture. Um, if we could now move to the Q&A session, again, as in last time, uh, feel free to either send me the questions directly or the MEI events team in writing, or you could raise your hand and I will be when you called upon to mute, unmute yourself and open your mic and ask the question directly. Um, so uh, while I wait for some questions, uh, if I could, if I could take the, my, my, position here as the moderator to ask a question. Uh, there's something particular about, um, about Hebrew's development uh, in contrast to a lot of other languages where uh, the vernacular culture preceded the literary culture, or there was a rich vernacular culture that was always in excess of the literary culture that came on later as, as, as the language grew and developed. Here, what it seems, especially with modern Hebrew, the, the literature, preceded the vernacular culture. How, how do you, in your opinion, how does this kind of shift trajectory or these alternate trajectories shape the nature of the language itself? Uh, it shaped it uh, precisely, I mean, you're very, you're very correct in, 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 can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, but a lot of echo, maybe you have to turn off one of uh, the, Maybe, maybe your computer, Mike. How is that now? That's, that's perfect, that's perfect. Okay, thank you. So uh, you're very correct in saying this, and this is what's one of the things I try to convey in my presentation, is that the role of writers in the development of modern Hebrew culture was very unusual and very unlike many other languages and culture because while Hebrew always was uh, used by Jews, it was so for many centuries and many millennia, the use of Hebrew was for religious ritual and for religious study, but not as a vernacular. And um, so while men particularly were proficient in Hebrew to some level, um, the ability to communicate on a daily basis by using the language was very limited. Um, there, we have a very interesting story from the 11th, from the 12th century about a Jewish traveler, Benjamin of Tudela, who for 10 years traveled from Spain throughout the Jewish world at the time, um, going, you know, um, throughout the southern parts of Europe, all the way to the Middle East, down to Yemen, uh, and published uh, a travelogue in which he communicated with all the Jews, communities of Jews that he met along the way in Hebrew, because that's the only language that he could actually communicate with them through. 
but that's kind of like um, an exception that proves the rule. Uh, and and, and the, the, the difference uh, in what happened in modernity is something uh, very interesting is that uh, these writers started using language first as a literary language. And then they, that literary language that I showed you samples of in my presentation shaped the actual culture that developed outside of it. So the, the, the written language for a very long time in modern Jewish history had an, had an outsized role in shaping the culture. So for example, many poets all the way up to the 1970s had a very important role in modernizing the language, inventing words for things, uh, shaping expressions that would then move from the pages of their poems and of their stories into real life. Now, this process, to some extent, of course, has uh, changed in the last, I would say, 50 or so years. But for a very long time, for almost about 150 years, uh, uh, from the beginning of the 19th century until well into the 50s, Hebrew literature and Hebrew poetry shaped the culture outside of it. And this is why studying Hebrew literature and Hebrew poetry as part of studying the Hebrew language is very, very important and unusually so in comparison to other languages. Uh, thank you so much. I have a question here from uh, Benny Gutayan from FTTREM. And he asked, Doc, uh, he asked Dr. Yaren, culture is dynamic and keeps changing. How do you see Jewish culture has changed within the modern and fast changing technology? So the question about how, how has like social media and technology added or developed this change in addition to the literary writing? Yeah, this is also a fascinating um, um, uh, language. And I think um, someone asked before, uh, before one of the questions that uh, my colleague uh, uh, Vardik Ringwald was asked is about the um, similarities between Arabic and Hebrew and um, how is that sort of helpful, helpful to think about the affinities between the two cultures uh, with respect to language learning. And I would like to use some of that discussion to answer this question because um, in Arabic, in Arabic speaking cultures, there is what we call in language, um, in, in linguistics, what we call diglossia, where there is a literary language usually preserved by texts that have a hallowed or a holy or a very important place in a culture, such as, for example, the Quran, which represents a very specific kind of Arabic, literary Arabic, um, uh, older Arabic. And then you have the vernaculars uh, in the various Arab countries that differ from that literary Arabic in significant ways. And sometimes they're mutually uh, in, uh, ineligible, I mean, you can't really understand them. Um, what may be happening in Hebrew is something similar, a slow divergence of what we would call literary Hebrew represented again by the Hebrew Bible, which is becoming progressively more unintelligible to Israelis and a more vernacular language that is developed by the rapid dissemination of social media, for example, which absorbs a lot of um, English and other words from other languages. It, the, 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 the situation in Israel, of course, is very, very far from the diglossia in the Arab speaking world, but one can see sort of a direction towards that kind of, um, you know, going towards that direction. I would also say though, but I would, I would say that unlike, for example, English or German or French, uh, the place of 
the Hebrew Bible in, uh, in, in Hebrew culture is so central, is so big, and will probably remain so forever, that it will always have a very, very strong influence on the nature of Hebrew and the structure of Hebrew and the vocabulary, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of diglossia will always be, or that, that kind of divergence will, will, will always be to some extent sort of um, uh, moderated or modified by that. Uh, thank you so much. I have another question in, and in, it is uh, somewhat related. Uh, it comes from Ong Bao Zhuan, and, uh, and they ask that, uh, with its origin as a sacred religious language, how did the modern version evolve to incorporate humor, uh, as in comedy, satire, parody? Uh, and this is a question that relates to what Bilahari also started with in, in the beginning about you know like using words that might not be appropriate is there is there any room for a proof for discussion on the profane or profane language within a sacred language as as, as hebrew that's a very interesting question i've never been asked this question but i would say that one of the advantages of hebrew as an ancient language is that the words a lot of words a lot of vocabulary words in hebrew have such have, have have so many layers of meaning because they were used, let's say, three thousand or so years ago, and throughout their life, uh, the, the, the the lives of these world of these words as first um, uh, historical words, then um, legal words, then um, experiential words. Uh, and then other kinds of words, they have gathered sort of a, um, such a richness of meaning that you, in fact, if you know the language well, uh, you can, in fact, play around with it and use it to very nuanced effects. I'm not saying it's better than other language. I'm just saying that it's a feature of Hebrew that languages that are less ancient um, uh, don't have that kind of um, feature or ability or aspect. And, I, and, and, and a lot of, uh, in, if you see, for example, there is a very popular show now on Israeli television that is called The Jews Are Coming. And that is a very modern satirical series of uh, skits that, um, takes, that, 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 that take place in, in the Bible it's scenes from the Hebrew Bible interpreted sort of very, very contemporary, you know, from a very contemporary perspective. Uh, and the differences between the original meaning of the words and the contemporary use creates a lot of the humor, a lot of the satire, and uh, really is a very rich aspect or linguistic aspect. Uh, thank you so much. We're we're running out of time, so I'm I'm gonna throw in a question very quickly, uh, and it comes from my a colleague at MEA Herman, and asks, was the use of Hebrew prior to the modern period limited to the liturgical con uh, context, or were there communities who did uh, use Hebrew in daily use? Is it correct to say that promotion of Hebrew as a modern language is very closely tied to the Zionist movement, and if so? Were there any writers or speakers of Hebrew at the time who did not support the Zionist movement? Uh, yeah, no, the, the, the um, development of modern Hebrew initially for uh, the duration of most, from, 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 from most of the 19th century, the um, development of Hebrew as a modern language was mostly a cultural and literary development that was not related to national aspirations of Jews and to Zionism at all. It is only in when the Zionism arose towards the end of the 19th century that uh, Hebrew became a vital component of it, but again, not from the very beginning. For example, the founder of political Zionism, Theodor Herzl, thought that the idea that Jews will move to Palestine and speak Hebrew, he thought the idea was ridiculous initially. Initially, 
he expected Jews to speak German in, in the new Jewish state in Palestine. Uh, later, he changed his mind after a lot of pressure by um, the majority of Zionists. But the connection between modern Hebrew and uh, Hebrew nationalism was not immediate and not um, uh, natural. Uh, it eventually became so, especially after 1914, in, during the so-called language wars in Palestine within the Jewish community in which the um, supporters of Hebrew won over people who wanted to speak German and Yiddish and other Jewish languages. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, we have more questions in, but we're running out of time. So thank you so much. Dr. Yara and Talek, we could maybe uh, bring up some of those questions in the in the in the at the end of the day discussion. Uh, so thank you so much for that talk, and uh, um, I would now like to in, go into our third session of the day. Uh, on uh, the session is titled Indonesian Muslims and Hebrew, and it gives me great pleasure to invite. Ustad Sapri Saleh, who really is one of the important architects behind putting together this conference. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Sapri Saleh is the author of Hebrew Indonesian Dictionary. His exposure to Hebrew commenced when he studied Arabic lit literature at Al Hazar University, Cairo, in 1989. There he started learning about Hebrew at the Israeli Cultural Center. Thereupon completing the study, he spent more than 10 years in numerous Arab countries and developed high proficiencies in Arabic, including lo local dialects. And he continued to learn Hebrew during his stay in the US and began writing Hebrew Indonesian dictionary in 2006. He now dedicates his time teaching Hebrew in Jakarta and is the only teacher of modern Hebrew in Indonesia. So thank you so much, uh, Ustaz Sapri Saleh for joining us today. And if I could ask you to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, 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 we can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Good morning uh, or good afternoon, whatever you are. Shalom Lekulam. Uh, thanks for having me in this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Middle East Institute of NUS to make this conference come into the reality. Uh, not only making the webinars comes into the reality, but I think giving us a chance, an opportunity to talk this kind of discussions uh, uh, in the academic matter, which is uh, I consider is very unique and the first time in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> Before I would uh, show you my presentation, uh, I would like to share you a little bit about my experience being a Hebrew teacher as a Muslim in Indonesia. It is give me an incredible and unique experience. Well, obviously, um, it is very rare and very hard to find a Muslim teaching Hebrew in Asia. As mentioned by uh, one of participants uh, before, yeah, there is one in, in India. His name is Dr. Kurshid Imam. I tried to invite him to uh, join this webinar, uh, but he has another uh, appointment, so he couldn't attend uh, our webinar tonight. <clears throat> and of course, we are in Indonesia, we have three Muslims, uh, Hebrew teachers. Uh, me, myself, um, and also my assistants, his name is Rinaldi, and the other ones is the lectures in University of Indonesia. She's devout Muslim also. Her name is Wiwin uh, Triminarti. Yeah? And I'm expecting one or less than two years to come. Hopefully, yeah? hopefully there are more than three Indonesian Muslim are on the way to be ready to teach Hebrew in Indonesia. <clears throat> Since I start teaching Hebrew uh, late 2017, yeah, there's, there are more than 216 students coming from the different uh, uh, backgrounds yeah, have been attending my class ever since. 
currently I have 20 new registered students are waiting list due to our limited of the time. <clears throat> As you know, in Indonesia, Hebrew was reluctant. I have to say that and unpopular. Um, not many pay attention that Hebrew, one of the important language in terms of uh, Middle East studies or consider it as a sister language of uh, uh, Arabic language that has been, you know, uh, studied in Middle East, Southeast Asia for many years, yeah. Also, not many knows that Hebrew text, uh, I consider has tremendous influence to the Christianity and Islam's religion. In Indonesia, Hebrew has been learned but limited uh, study within Christian uh, theology university. And Hebrew uh, considered as a very secret language. I would like to inform you. I want to share you my my statistic number that taken from my YouTube channel, teaching Hebrew, Hebrew alphabeticals, made it by six series, six part of the videos. Each part, each part of video, it takes like it's about four minutes or three and four minutes. There are 15,000 viewers. Um, and I will consider that 15,000 viewers are not only viewers, but also they are a learner at the same time. There are 15,000 are visiting the video number six, the number, the, the last video that we are presenting in the, our YouTube channel, teaching Hebrew alphabeticals. Uh, those 15,000 uh, number are excluded from the first video that we made it. Number one, number two, number three, and number four, and number five people. We only took that, uh, the numbers in the number six uh, video. In the number, that, no, number one videos, there are 105,000 viewers on our video. Those number increase is about 200 every week. So the, the numbers moving, by one week, it's about 200. In the other hand, we also create a tutorial grammatical Hebrew and how to write in cursive. Because in Indonesia, you know, writing uh, Hebrew in hand is not, is not familiar. So I, 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 I show them how to guide them how to do a writing hand with the cursive letters. There are 10,000 viewers or learner in that, uh, I think more than 10,000, yeah. Of course, many of the viewer are Muslim like me, uh, suggested by the, their comment that we have written below. Almost all the tone of their comments are enthusiastic and supportive, or some viewers are given negative remarks, but the numbers was considered insignificant, yeah. And now, they keep contact sometimes you know they email me uh, quite often they call me by 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 phone they invite me to discuss how to uh, learn hebrew in better way and most of the question they ask me as what's the benefit or significance of learning hebrew for muslim so in this regard, I would like to show you, I want to share you uh, my, over here now, yeah. Hebrew is, I always tell to my, my, my fellow Muslim friends in Indonesia, Hebrew is similar to Arabic in many ways. Yeah. The similarity what the language can, can be seen from, from the name itself not by reading in, in, in English, Arabic, in Hebrew, you won't see the connections of it. But if you read those names on Arabic or in Hebrew, you simply switch, uh, position the second letters and the third letter to exchange their place, you will find this, those two languages are very, very close. And there are more than hundreds more than hundred vocabularies, almost identical and coming from the same group. We'll give you an example in this. Uh, 
for at, for the attendee who participants so I can read the the Arabic and Hebrew. Look at this for for instance. Ofkon, ofkon, alif, fa, and kaf. Alif and and look at it in Hebrew also. Alif, fa, and kaf. Kutbun, kote. Yeah, it's the same letters. It seems like copy paste. And many are like this. Uh, I know well, for for your information, I teach uh, Arabic also in Jakarta. So I found it, the, the language very similar. Sometimes you find that, that like a copy paste between Arabic and, and, and Hebrew. And look at this now in the term of a bad verbs. Sin, mim, ain, samia. Yeah, it's almost the same. Sin, mim, ain, also meaning here. Both language has the same meaning here to here. And ahala, alif, alif, and kaf, and lam. And also meaning eating in both language, like kataba, kataba, almost the same. Not almost, this is like copy paste. And that's in terms of verbs. Now, if you see the, uh, the nouns, also has the same uh, root. And this is the most interesting thing is also is syntax similarity between, between Arabic and Hebrew. Both languages are, uh, are based on three letters. Root system determine their other meaning, and both language use the same letter pattern. Yeah? Fa'ala in Arabic, fa ain lam, and also in, in Hebrew, pe ain lamet. Uh, in Hebrew, believe in sores. Yeah, root Arabic doesn't use the terminology of sores, Arabic use a, a juzur al kalima, jazur al kalima, but also Arabic has. A word for the sores, which is shirs, but Arabic doesn't use this one. Arabic use uh, juzur, which is also in Hebrew we have jizra. The similarity of uh, the the three root letters, huh? and many many are the same like Arabic, uh, especially when you see that in the verb conjugations. We we say that in in Arabic tasriful afal and natiya in in Hebrew, pay attention, you know, in the, for example, this is kara'a, kara'a, ko fresh alef, and ko ra alif. Both uh, a word meaning reading. Look the conjugation, look, pay attention to the conjugation in the future, in the future case. Ani, ana, anahnu, nahnu, it's almost the same. Ata, anta, and look at this in the futures, you add, Letters before sores, before the root. If in Anim, you add Aleph. In Arabic, also you add Aleph. Anahnu, also you add Nun. And the same like in the past tense, also. In the case of the past tense, Karati, Karatu, Karanu, Karana, and so and so on. It seems for me that look like a copy paste. <laughs> uh, <coughs> For for uh, for the students has learned Arabic uh, in learning Hebrew it it will not quite challenge. I I believe for uh, my experience my from uh, my experience from my students whoever had learned Arabic before they will not face difficulties of learning Hebrew. The same thing in obsess a possessive you know will give you an example. Uh, by by also in Arabic by if you say my house, ani, you add ya in the end by ti by ti by nu by na, and so and so. Now um, uh, this is the interesting thing that you know uh, Hebrew and Arabic because both are uh, very similar uh, language. So we met that in Bahasa Indonesia, which is Malayu. Yeah? It's a lot of similarity vocabulary in Bahasa Indonesia are driven from Arabic language or Hebrew language. We don't know, we need to uh, 
exactly um, make some research. Is Sadaka is a Hebrew language or Arabic language, but we met in Bahasa Indonesia. We, I call that a, a meeting point of uh, uh, culture, right? Between Hebrew and Arabic uh, through Bahasa Indonesia or Malay. <laughs> Uh, I, I would like to mention the, the remark that uh, Professor uh, Roni Trici uh, gave me the remark in my dictionary. Uh, the most interesting things for him is uh, the, the, the modern history of the two language between Hebrew and Bahasa Indonesia. In, the, in, in Hebrew side, the revival of Hebrew in modern age and it is adoption as a language of Jewish nation. In other hand, in other hand, that he said that Bahasa Indonesia, which is adapted from a uh, language of Malay, Bahasa Indonesia also become a unifying language in uh, as officials Indonesians uh, language in Indonesia to unite uh, Indonesian people in Indonesia. Which is for for your information, Indonesian has uh, more than 700 languages in Indonesia. So the government has united uh, people of Indonesia by choosing Malay as their language. That's, uh, I don't know if it's come to accidents, but he say this similarity cannot be ignored, ignored or underestimated. Uh, this is also for, for me is right, as a Muslim, Israeli law studies. We say that in Arabic, uh, Israeliyat. This is one of the examples. The, the study, uh, the study of uh, Israeliyat, very quite popular within modern intellectual Islam. Uh, <clears throat> in Indonesia, the narrative of Israeliyat laws also very popular within Islamic uh, traditional schools like in Pesantren and Madrasa. Unfortunately, the, the narrative only available in Arabic, as I saw you in, the, in my presentation now, which is the majority of Muslim intellectuals believe the Israeli Lord or Israeliyat narrative originally it's come from the Hebrew text. Uh, in this case, Hebrew able me to compare and cross check the Hebrew narrative in order to clarify, to clarify the narrative, two narrative. The story that like this one, Israeliyat coming from the uh, Israeli law. I believe, I believe that understanding Hebrew in this regard as essential and fully comprehend to the com commentary of Al-Quran. I think this is the core of the Israeli, Israeli studies, Israeli law study. And also, Hebrew will help us to make um, intelligent decisions about the translations, interpretation, and text critical decision made in any language translation and commentaries. Uh, <clears throat> and then let's, uh, all right, I will show you the early Muslim that applied the Israeli Lord to their uh, Magna Falls. In fact, we are also running a little short on time. Uh, we have to be able to question answers too. All right, uh, I'm almost done with my, okay. So, okay, so uh, the impact that uh, uh, teaching and learning in Hebrew in Jakarta uh, promote understanding, tolerance, and building the bridge. Uh, I have to mention that my class, my Hebrew class in Indonesia uh, is about practicing tolerance on daily basis. Uh, let's move to the, because we are running uh, out of time. This is the challenging that we, we face now in Indonesia, lack of access to the good Hebrew resource. Luckily that we have uh, Brandeis Modern Hebrew that write by Bardit and friends. We learn uh, the methodology, pedagogy over there, and approaching, and we combine, we modify a little bit with the Indon Indonesian approach. Yeah. Uh, also lack of the communication to the native uh, Hebrew speaker. Yeah. We did try uh, last year uh, with a student in Indonesia to communicate with the students of Hebrew University. And also we did the, with the student 
in Middlebury yeah? uh, in 2018. And uh, that's, uh, I think, this kind of event which should be, you know, quite often to happen. Negative stereotypes against Jewish culture in Israel, that's a challenging for us. And, uh, and most of the people in Indonesia consider modern Hebrew is a different to the classic one. Uh, but they quite question me what kind of Hebrew you are teaching. Oh, I can only answer them what the classic biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew has used the same alphabeticals and focals and the way of writing, the way of uh, uh, <clears throat> grammaticals, many grammatical has the same. So, you know, yes, it is a, a different, but a slight different for, for us, it's not many different between, between uh, classic and, and the modern one. This is what a being Hebrew teacher as a Muslim in, in Indonesia is yes, a little bit uh, highly daunting, but I enjoy this one. Let's move to the, my conclusion now is uh, Hebrew Learning Center in Southeast Asia is highly relevant. I think. So we need uh, uh, like a, a center of and standard of learning Hebrew in South Asia. So people in South Asia has more access of learning Hebrew. Uh, I believe that uh, proficiency in Hebrew helped us to understand sacred and non-sacred texts and enrich knowledge of the Middle East, of course, yeah, more uh, comprehended. Hebrew also learning helps to recognize the closeness among the three Abrahamic religions. Hebrew is fun and is to learn. Uh, we've been proved this one for four years. Um, well, some are failed, but um, many of them are continue and enjoying that. That's really fun. We find fun in, in learning Hebrew. It's a lot of challenging, especially, especially students uh, with the Arabic background, they really enjoy learning Hebrew. Uh, working together, collaboration and support Hebrew is critical in Southeast Asia. That's all from me tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for that talk. Uh, I'm going to go into questions directly because we're a little short of time. And the first question comes from Ong Bao Zhuan and asking about, uh, about, the, about the punctuation system or, or is there a similarity between uh, how you use punctuation marks in Arabic and Hebrew? Yeah, punctu yeah um, actually the two languages has a similarity of a punctual. In, in Arabic, we have only uh, three vocalizations, A, E, and U. But in Hebrew, we add two more. We have five in Hebrew, A, U, E, E, U. So which is, we don't have that in uh, But to adjust that one is very easy. For people who has a background in Arabic, we just remove a, a, a focal of O and a, Arabic doesn't have A and A, A and A, no, O and A. Uh, thank you. We have another question, and this question relates to the discussion that we were having earlier about how languages are also vehicles for culture. And this question comes in from uh, Binsar Karyanto from STTREM, and they are asking about how when Muslims learn about uh, Muslims learn Hebrew, how do they respond to conceptions of God and religion within Judaism? Is there a contradiction? Do is there similarity? <laughs> like how, how do you? Deal with that? Yeah, I am. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting question. Um, for for I have a right to to learn Hebrew. It doesn't mean that I'm a Muslim. I cannot learn Hebrew and then I couldn't find any interesting thing in, in the Hebrew text. But actually learning Hebrew as a Muslim, as I, I present my presentation, is very related to language that I had learned it for many years, which is Arabic. And in the same time that I, I find the similarity, understanding that we are uh, very close to find out our God is, um, well, it's up to us, of course, you know, we, uh, that's for me, it's uh, to find, to connect Hebrew and the God is very personal, which is I cannot interfere to any, anyone about uh, understanding about the God through the Hebrew. 
Thank you. We have another question from Emilia Jakarta Learning Center. And she is asking, uh, in your opinion, uh, why is it so important for people in Indonesia to learn Hebrew? Yeah, as I mentioned before that uh, Indonesian is uh, a country that still uh, uh, believe in religion. We have the two uh, dominant religions of the year, which is Christianity and Islam. The, the majority of the population is Islam. We have to put in notice that Hebrew, for me, is a Hebrew text has tremendous influence. I, I mentioned that before, had tremendous influence to our religion as Islam. And we should go through the text itself to find out the, the similarity, the closeness, and, and understanding more cultures, it's uh, give you some um, uh, the insight. Uh, I think it's uh, <clears throat> you will get a, a, a value, extra value uh, compared with anybody that you know doesn't uh, understand reading the the culture of Israeli culture of Hebrew uh, through the, the translations. But find out the culture itself through the, the original language will give you more details about uh, things. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have my colleague, uh, Dr. Asa Shuja has his hand up. So if I could ask him to um, uh, please ask your question. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Amin. Uh, Actually, uh, whenever I listen to these uh, discussions on language, uh, you know, um, it, it doesn't develop in vacuum uh, because uh, there has to be some force uh, which fuses a lot of energy, sometimes in the form of a monetary form. And that is how the, de the language develops. Again, I'll give you an example from India that uh, uh, before 79, the rise and fall of uh, Persian literature and language in the popularity of it in India, uh, it was a lot before 79 revolution because uh, the Shah of Iran used to infuse a lot of money in terms of inviting the scholars, uh, the lecturers, professors, and giving them a lot of scholarship. We do have Iranian culture center now, but that kind of infusion, injection of money is not there. And now that we are talking about uh, the development of Hebrew in, in a non-Israeli country, you know, non-Israeli uh, platform, uh, because I understand, you know, the problems or the financial hurdles that these professors face, uh, or what exactly the sort of support that is given by the Israeli government, because we do have a representation here. Is it uh, uh, up to the potential or if there is something that could be done more to popularize the uh, Hebrew in other countries where some of the professors are really working hard to popularize this language. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, look, it was the, the, it was the question or uh, a, a comment? Uh, yes, uh, it is a question from you, professor, that, uh, you know, in your journey, in your journey, is there in some hardship, especially the financial economic hardship that you face? If there is something, some kind of support that you think that could come up from the Israeli side, or if it is sufficient, even if, it, if that is a question, you know, or if you could tell us if it's sufficient support that you have, so. Oh, th thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll keep that as my private uh, things that, you know, I just don't like to, uh, to share the, it, uh, my struggling in, in, in uh, promoting Hebrew in, in Jakarta, I rather uh, stay independent. Uh, the reason why I stay independent, I don't want someone that will talk behind me that someone that has told you to do things. It wasn't pure coming from me. So I don't want to share that, but I, I can guarantee to you that I don't accept anything from anybody just to make my, uh, my journey smooth and not be bothered with anybody. And so far, Alhamdulillah, Baruch Hashem, um, so far so good. Okay, 
thank you so much. I think that is about, I still have uh, several questions and it's sort of, you know, such an exciting talk that we could go on for uh, much longer, but we are running out of time and you can actually ask those questions people who have in our breakout session. So just to explain it to you very briefly, for the next 15 minutes, we will be going into six different breakout rooms. You will be assigned a room automatically, but uh, feel free to change your room if uh, you choose. And in those discussion rooms, there would be a focused discussions on some of these questions with one of the speaker, one of the six speakers that we have. So um, yes, if, if uh, Sharon, if you could go about with that, how. And after the, after, so after the, the, it's a 15 minute session and uh, on 14 minutes, 14 minutes, you'd be, you'd be pointed out that there's one minute left. So collect your thoughts. And at the end of this breakout room, we would come back together and the leaders of each of these breakout rooms will have two minutes to present the key findings from the discussions within their breakout room. Welcome everyone back to the main room. Uh, I hope everyone got a chance to have a fruitful and a more closer discussion with the participants in your breakout room. Uh, now, what I would like to do is I would like to ask each of the six speakers who will be presenting at our conference to uh, maybe say, uh, use a couple of minutes to point out to the main findings and uh, the, the, the points of discussions in their session. Um, I think there is some order in which uh, we will go. Uh, I am not sure. Sharon, do we have an order in which we should be speaking? Okay, uh, you can go in the in order of um, the speakers. So, but it first. Okay. Are you on okay. Yeah, we can we can go in the in the order. So, uh, uh, Doctor Doctor Ringwald, if you could say take the first two minutes. Oh, okay. Thank you. I just returned to the main room, so we didn't have much time to discuss it. But uh, we really uh, focusing. We were focusing on clarifications related to the discussions uh, that we had uh, during the three presentations. Um, what's interesting is that I found out that um, there is a, 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 a wish to have more resources um, in Southeast Asia to study Hebrew, um, more access to materials, including a specific textbook or materials to, to, to learn the language that fits the needs, the specific profile of students in Southeast Asia. Uh, so this is the one thing that uh, was raised in our group and opportunities, many, and more opportunities just to gather and study the language, more venues to develop more venues. Um, and there was an interesting discussion that uh, I think it's related to this uh, resources issue is a, learners desire to understand themselves as learners what would it take to become a better learner? What does it mean to be a good learner of Hebrew language? Uh, how can I identify my style, my strategy in order to maximize the processes of acquisition for me or maybe for, for, for my students of my, of my colleagues? So these are the type of resources that uh, was raised as an issue or desire to, to have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pelik, if you could take two minutes as well. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. I'm sorry, but I for some reason I can't turn on my video, but um, uh, I, I, uh, but uh, the discussion in my room was very much along the lines of uh, what Bardit was saying. Uh, which is really a very big um, interest in uh, materials. There's problem of access to materials, the availability of materials because of all kinds of reasons. 
Um, and because of the sort of lack of interest in Hebrew, uh, I shouldn't be, perhaps I shouldn't be saying it this way. The, um, since uh, relatively few people are interested in studying the language, uh, there are limited uh, availabilities uh, to do so. And so these are the two main problems that people spoke about, but uh, of course they did, participants did express uh, an interest in this and a thirst that um, a, they would like to somehow um, uh, be able to, to solve a problem they might be, be able to solve. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Ustaz uh, Safri Saleh, if you could take two minutes as well. Uh, you're still mute, on mute. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, yes. yes. Our, our meeting uh, was, uh, the questions around my uh, challenging that I face in, in Indonesia. Uh, of course, the good resource that's uh, the most challenging that we have over here. We couldn't, con you know, we couldn't uh, provide better materials to uh, our audience in Indonesia. The only one that we have, only one book, we couldn't give another, you know. Uh, we can we can answer many, you know, deeper questions by contacting my friends yeah, to help me. For instance, if I don't, because my Hebrew is not really really good as part of here. <laughs> I, you know, my my Hebrew is daily reading and writings, and but sometimes I face um, difficult uh, questions. And then I, I pending it, I have to contact my friend and native speakers in Israel, for instance, and to pending the questions about the, that's mean we have a lack of resources. Um, that can be, I hope can be solved this, uh, as, as Fadid mentioned before, that we should uh, make some uh, uh, resources that is the access to, to the student in, in Southeast Asia. And, and also questions, they asked me uh, how I faced the challenging that is uh, related to the political issue or any things that connected to culture as far as two cannot be separate between culture and, and language. Uh, I always avoid, uh, my key is to avoid the, the, the connection between Hebrew and politics. I rather connect that with the religion instead of politics. So I avoid, I avoid that uh, connection. That's what our discussion. Thank, in, in thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Joffrey Khan. If you could also unmute yourself and take a couple of minutes. Uh, be Elizabeth. Joffrey is not here. Okay. Sure. Um, I can talk about our group. So I think a lot of things that we talked about were mentioned here, such as future opportunities for collaboration, um, attracting students to study Hebrew in Asia. Um, I think two two comments that were not already mentioned were um, an interest in talking maybe tomorrow a little bit about how to approach teaching modern Hebrew to students who are mainly interested in studying Hebrew for religious reasons, um, and maybe tips on how to approach that. Um, and then the second comment was just, I think um, an appreciation for this event and the, the great timing to collaborate together and to really work together to advance the teaching of Hebrew and um, language and culture in Asia. And um, also someone mentioned the importance of what Freddie said about, you know, teaching culture and, and addressing maybe perceptions that people have from childhood about a certain culture, about Israel from um, their own culture and, and the importance of um, educating about, um, about culture through language study, so. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Leonard Chris, uh, Chrysostomus, if you could also take a couple of minutes. Well, since I'm not really precise meeting, so I just listening from the aspiration. I just surprised that there's uh, many enthusiasm regardless, there's uh, many, many challenges as well. But I truly see this is a step forward to for us all to uh, move forward and uh, looking for the many, many opportunities, especially since uh, Pasapri is very 
very uh, formative person, very formative figure for us all in Indonesia to start the, the, the issue together to have uh, Hebrew as a meeting point for all of us. And I think I will share more of you later on uh, tomorrow how a religious uh, issue is the entry point for Hebrew studies to have a set to set foot in Indonesia. I think that's all. It's very much uh, my personal opinion after, after learning from the discussion around. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think with that about wraps up the day for today. Um, thank you everyone for joining in and enthusiastically participating in this very unique discussion about Hebrew language in Southeast Asia. Things have been set up very nicely for the day two. And I hope everyone who joined in today can also participate tomorrow and push this discussion forward. And really we can in the end come up with some of the even solutions to the questions and challenges that have been faced in the discussion today. So again, thank you, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining and have a good evening um, uh, from, from our side. Thank you. <laughs>